Now, at the time, Cabela's was a relatively healthy company. It was posting nearly $2 billion a year in gross profits. It was, but why was its stock price 50% lower? Because it was at real risk, because of the changing retail industry, because of online businesses. Again, the stock market does not reflect your performance today. The stock price reflects your expected performance in the future. Tucker, you need a 101 finance class, and I have just the professor for you, me. So anytime I'm available to teach you just a little bit of finance, because it would be helpful, given that you're commenting on stuff in finance. I got my PhD in this. I know this stuff. All right, Tucker's not listening. Maybe one of his producers would. Maybe you could forward this link to one of Tucker's producers. Oh, uh, four billion. That's America. Thrift stores and methadone clinics, that's America. Community after community. Desiccated, empty husks with nothing left. Huge swaths of the United States look like that now. <laughs> I mean, none of that would stand up to any kind of statistic. And none of that is true. And of course, Ever been to a ghost town? Ever been to a ghost town? You know, like in the 19th century where they mined for gold, they mined for copper, mined for something, and then the copper ran out and everybody left and moved on? I mean, if you drive along Route, what is it, Route 69, Route 66, the route that goes kind of from the Midwest all the way to California before the highway systems, you drive through lots of ghost towns. Industry shut down, but the people didn't die. Americans don't shrivel up and die when a factory closes. Americans get up off their butt, climb onto the horse, and ride. Ride to where the jobs are. Today, it's a lot easier. Today, you can get into your automobile. You can take a plane. You can ride in a train and go to where the jobs are. If America is the way Tucker Carlson is describing it, it's because... Some Americans are not willing to take responsibility for their own lives because people like Tucker Carlson have told them they should not. And instead, they sit around, wait around for stuff to happen to them. That's not America. That's not what the American spirit is. Create your own destiny. That's what America is about. It only gets worse from here, guys. So what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. Some of them are complicated and hard Some to change. But one of the big factors in this slow-moving disaster is the utter transformation of the way our leaders think about the American economy. So it's the utter transformation of the way our leaders think about the American economy. And what is that transformation? It used to be that our leaders cared about the people. And now they're ruthlessly capitalist. He doesn't say that, but that's exactly what he means. During the last Gilded Age, 125 years ago, America's ruling class may have been ostentatiously rich, and they were. Go to Newport, Rhode Island for proof, if you like. But it was still a recognizably American class. Tycoons accumulated fortunes, but they also felt some obligation to the country around them. So, accumulating fortunes is not enough. This is typical leftist point. Accumulating fortune doesn't count. What matters is what you give back. And in the 19th century, Tucker's going to say, the tycoons gave back. They were real Americans. Today, the tycoons are, here it is. He doesn't say it, but what he means is globalists. They don't care about America. So they don't give back. And that's the problem. Really? <laughs> ben and I would rip Tucker Carlson at anybody in a real debate. Tucker Carlson doesn't have a chance. He knows absolutely nothing about economics, about the economy, about America, about how jobs are created, about what's really going on in this country. He is a mouthpiece. He's a propaganda mouthpiece. And by the way, for those of you who wonder, I've debated dozens of people. I've done dozens of debates. 
So steel ty tycoon Andrew Carnegie famously built stone libraries around the country. Yeah, that's what makes him good. He built libraries rather than he actually reshaped the steel industry in this country, created millions and millions of jobs. I mean, thousands and thousands of jobs and created, built this country by building its industry. That's what makes Carnegie special, not the libraries. Libraries are nice edification of people beneath him. John D. Rockefeller and many other so-called robber barons set aside huge portions of their wealth and in some cases their property to make this country better. That's what makes them good guys. This is, this is the complete and utter bankruptcy of conservatives. That they think for a minute, they think for a minute that what makes the so-called robber barons good guys and, and the idea that, you know, they didn't shut down factories, they didn't shut down towns, they didn't, no, they were the good guys, they only created jobs and they were socially responsible. He sounds like Bernie Sanders. In the old days, the robber barons were socially responsible. The problem today is they're not socially responsible enough. Hey. All right. Yellowstone, Acadia National Park, etc. Oh yeah, we got Maybe National Park. Maybe most Parks significantly, of these guys. in January of 1914, Henry Ford more than doubled the prevailing factory wage to a then remarkable five dollars for an eight-hour day. Ford didn't have to do that, but his company was succeeding, and he thought he should. Really? Oh my God! I mean, this is the kind of fake history, not just fake news, Tucker Carlson engages in but fake history that he is providing us. Why did Ford double wages to $5 a day in 1914? What was he trying to do? Was he, try, was, he, was he thinking, I mean, I don't know if you've read a little bit about Ford, but it was Ford thinking, oh, we're doing well, so we should share some of our prosperity with our workers. Is that what he was doing? No. What Ford actually did was raise wages to $5 an hour, fire his most unproductive workers, and attracted to himself, because he doubled wages, the best, most productive workers in the entire auto industry. What he did was raise wages so he could make more money. What he did is raise wages so he could attract the best, most productive people in an incredibly competitive market in an incredibly competitive market for labor, what Ford did was maintain his best people, attract the best people, and fired the people who couldn't live up to $5 an, an hour, a, a day, sorry, $5 a day. So it's just nuttiness to present, oh, the robber barons weren't robber barons, really. They were good guys because they did philanthropy and they paid their way workers well. I mean, if you've read how Carnegie and many of these guys treated their workers, some of it is embarrassing to a defender of capitalism like me. I mean, they bought out of Pinkertons sometimes to shoot them. <sighs> and yet, he's whitewashing that in order to make his point about how wonderful they were because today's industrialists, today's financiers, a sheer evil, sheer evil. Why? At the end of the day, the reason is because they don't support Donald Trump. Some historians trace the creation of the American middle class to that decision. Either way, it is nearly impossible to imagine a big company doing anything like that today. Attitudes are just too different. Really, no big company today would raise wages. Amazon did not raise wages to $15 an hour minimum wage. They did. They raised them for all workers, $15 minimum wage at Amazon. They did that recently. Walmart has done it. Other companies in technology, it's done all the time. The idea that somehow today, because they're focused on 
uh, Tucker Carlson tell you? Which finance mogul looks at workers merely as cost to be reduced or eliminated entirely. Which is funny when you think about what some of the, what some of the uh, great industrialists of the 19th century did and how they treated workers. Today, corporations, today's businesses, today's financiers, today's capitalists are far more, far more worker friendly. Far more worker friendly than they were in the 19th century. I mean, it's such a joke. It is such a joke. But it's not a joke. This is purposeful lying, purposeful deception, purposeful misrepresentation of the truth. This is worse, as bad, as the New York Times at its worst. But he isn't building a lot of public libraries these days. Instead, the model... Really? All those philanthropists, they're not building anything? They're not contributing? I mean, American billionaires don't contribute anything? Where do you live, Tucker? Which America? I mean, you, you are spending too much time in New York, I think. But if you go, by the way, if you go in New York to the, I don't know, to the ballet. Now, ballet, you know, it's highfalutin stuff, but it's, it's the ballet. Who built that ballet? Well, it's got a big sign on the front of the ballet. I, I love it because all those New York leftists, they have to pass. They have to pass through this and, and see this. But right on the New York ballet, it says in big type, Donated by David Koch <laughs> from the Koch brothers. All those leftists have to go and see the ballet knowing that it is made possible from a donation by David Koch, the, the man they hate more than anything else. <laughs> hey, Tucker, you don't live in America. You have no clue what America is like. Ruthless economic efficiency. Buy a distressed company, yeah. outsource the jobs, yeah. liquidate the valuable assets, fire middle management, and once the smoke is cleared, dump what remains to the highest bidder. Off. And there's something wrong with all of that that he just described? That's called creative destruction. That's called economic progress. That's called reassigning capital to its more productive use. That's called job creation. That's called job creation. Because by dismantling capital that's inefficient by dismantling and destroying jobs that do not produce. One frees up the capital to create jobs elsewhere. And that's why there are more jobs today than ever before. That's why unemployment is so low today in America. Not because of Trump or, or, or Tucker Carlson, but because capitalists are deploying capital more and more and more efficiently. And that's why there were jobs in the 80s, as the Rust Belt was shutting down, jobs disappearing, going away. Exactly the process he just described. All of that happening. And at the same time, jobs appeared elsewhere. Many, many more jobs because unemployment was declining throughout. By the way, anybody really interested in understanding what I'm going to be talking about today and understanding why the fallacy, the complete and utter garbage that is everything that Tucker is, is just said and is going to say for the rest of the show. There's a movie I recommend. And in the movie depicts exactly this restructuring of America. And the movie actually represents what is really going on amazingly effectively. It's a little funny can be a little vulgar here and there. And it hero, the hero of the movie, purposefully is played, purposefully in the sense that they put the guy they put this actor there on purpose to make you want to ridicule it. Now now Wall Street. Wall Street is the opposite. Wall Street depicts the opposite. Wall Street is a complete misunderstanding of what this process is. The movie is other people's money. One of the maybe the best movie ever made about finance. It is a great movie about finance, not qua movie, I don't know if it's great, but qua finance, it's a great movie. The speeches there are brilliant. Danny DeVito's character is brilliant. And of course, the bad guy in the movie is Gregory Peck. So the good guy is DeVito. The bad guy is Gregory Peck. The bad guy represents Tucker Carlson. The good guy is me, represents me. 
my arguments about finance. And if you see that movie, you see why sometimes businesses have to be shut down. Workers have to be fired. Assets need to be sold to the highest bidder. And why? The existence of financiers that can do this, the existence of financiers that engage in this kind of activity is essential, crucial to a thriving economy, essential, crucial to capitalism. All right. Let's keep going with Tucker. We're only two minutes in. There's still eight minutes. Eight minutes of lying and misrepresentation. Asia. It's happened around the country. It has made a small number of people phenomenally rich. Yeah, good. One of them is a New York-based hedge fund manager called Paul Singer. Paul Singer is a massive contributor to the Republican Party. And I think, from what I read, a never Trumper. That is his real sin. According to Forbes, has amassed a personal fortune of more than $3 billion. How has Singer made that money? We made a lot of it by purchasing sovereign debt from financially distressed countries, countries that were in trouble, usually at a massive discount. Once a country's economy regains some stability, Singer would bombard its government with lawsuits, a massive public relations campaign originating here in Washington sometimes, until he made his money back with interest. The practice is called vulture capitalism. Now, notice that he's saying all this with a smirk and is horrible. Ugh. He buys distressed debts of countries that get into trouble. Somehow they get into trouble. What Paul Singer is known for doing, particularly famous for the Argentina debt, is buying debt of countries that have collapsed economically. And buying them for pennies on a dollar. Because they become socialist countries, and the economy's collapsed, and they won't pay. Or the market fear they won't pay. And what Peter Singer does is he forces them to pay. He uses the legal system. He uses the courts. Not thugs, not gangsters. The courts the rule of law, to force countries that take on too much debt and then can't pay it, force them through means, legal means, to pay their debts. I mean, Peter Singer is a hero. A hero. By forcing countries, governments, to live up to their obligations, by forcing countries, governments, who are irresponsible, to pay the debts that they've accumulated, I mean, Greece needed a Peter Singer to go after them. I don't think he did it because I don't think the rule of law would have applied in quite the same way in Europe. But he did go after Argentina. And he made a fortune doing it. Because while everybody else had given up on Argentina ever paying back its debt, Peter Singer forced them by using American courts, by freezing Argentinian assets in America to pay the debts that they took on. But Tucker Carlson doesn't see it that way. This is vulture capitalism. This is people taking advantage of, oh, those weak countries. The weak countries that have borrowed money from people and won't pay it back. I mean, it really is disgusting. I mean, Singer is actually forcing government to live up to their obligations. Good for him. And he's done this in country after country after country. And they know now, they know, that if they threaten not to pay their debts, if they threaten to default on their obligations, people like Peter Singer and other hedge fund managers, hedge fund managers, will enter the market, buy up the debt, and use legal resources, use the rule of law to go after them and force them to do it. Indeed, in Argentina, he was basically responsible for, ultimately, the conviction of a president, uh, Christina. She's now the vice president. She came back. But she was convicted of fraud, partially related to this, these bonds. Because she took out debt and then refused to pay. That's wrong. 
And we should be defending people who call that out as wrong. But no, the new conservative, the nationalist conservative, the Donald Trump conservatives of today, God forbid we should stand up for an entrepreneuring capitalist Never. We're going to go with governments all the way, even the corrupt socialist ones. Feeding off the carcass of a dying nation. Carcass of a dying nation. How disgusting is that? In some ways, it's not so different from what Singer and his firm, Elliott Management, have done in this country and ah, to this country. Now we get to Over it. Over the past couple of decades, Elliott Management has made billions by buying large stakes in American companies, then firing workers, driving up short-term share prices, and in some cases taking government bailouts, insult to injury. Now, how do you, how, how is it that by firing workers you raise short-term, short-term stock prices? It doesn't work that way. If you fire workers and by doing so sacrifice a long-term profitability of the country, company, then stock prices will go down. Stock prices reflect in a price today the expectations about future profits of the company. So if you're just firing workers to raise profitability right now at the expense of the future, your stock price will go down. There are lots of examples in history, lots of examples of companies cutting workers and the stock price going down, not up. Why going down? Because they've sacrificed long-term profits for short-term accounting gain. But again, Tucker doesn't understand how stock markets work. Tucker has no concept of how capitalism works. So for him, if you make money and you've cut, sh and you've cut workers, I mean, he's a socialist. A leftist, at least, if not a socialist. <sighs> Bloomberg News once described Singer as, quote, the world's most feared investor. He is. He is, because when he invests in your company, you better be on top of it. You better be efficient. You better be productive. You better be in a position to make money. Making money is a good thing. Making money is a sign of value creation. Making money is what creates the capital that employs people, ultimately. But it's not about employment. Lots of companies shrink to make more money by buying robots, for example. It's about making money. And the more wealth you create, the more jobs are created in the economy, even if not in your company. Again, it's such bogus economics. Somebody says conservatives are such boomers. What is, what is, boomer has become this amazing insult now. I don't think Tucker's a boomer. I am, I guess. I'm at the tail end of the boomer generation. Tells you a lot. No one's even pretending Paul Singer's tactics are good for anyone but Paul Singer. Not true. I'm pretending, hey, Paul Singer's tactics are good for America. The Paul Singers of the world are what keep America competitive. It's the Paul Singers of the world is what move the world forward. It would make innovation possible. It would freeze up the capital for all the goodies, for all the things that makes your life possible, Tucker Carlson. And his fund. Consider the case of Delphi, the automotive parts supplier. Right, During the last financial Delphi. crisis, a consortium of hedge funds, including Singer's Elliott Management, purchased Delphi. Now, notice what he doesn't say. Notice what he doesn't say. He says, during the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, a consortium of hedge funds led by Paul Singer purchased Delphi. Now, how did they do that? Did they buy its stock on the market? How did they do that? Well, he's missing an important piece here. Delphi was bankrupt. Delphi was an auto parts maker. I'm going to give you the whole story rather than just the pieces that Tucker Carlson wants to give you because that's what I do. I kind of try to be objective, try to give you facts rather than fake, false, biased, partial news. Delphi was an auto parts manufacturer. And until 1999, it was basically a part of GM. GM used it to make all the auto parts for its cars. In 1999, General Motors 
spun Delphi out with the idea of one to raise capital by selling it into the public. It, it raised money. And secondly, with the idea that Delphi could now manufacture parts for lots of other car companies and therefore diversify and maybe become a more profitable, more successful company, not just dependent on General Motors. Well, it didn't work out quite that way. One of the things that was spun out with Delphi was the pension plans of the union and all the union wages and all the union problems that have crippled for decades the American auto industry. And in 2005, six years after it was spun out, and well before the financial crisis, I might note, six years after it was spun out from General Motors, it filed for bankruptcy. Bankruptcy. In 2008, it was still bankrupt as the financial crisis hit and auto sales plummeted. And the biggest crisis in American auto industry in history occurred. Delphi was on the verge of liquidation, on the verge of selling all its asset, firing all its workers, and shutting down completely. The only thing that was keeping it alive were payments from General Motors, small payments. But by 2008, 2009, GM couldn't afford to do that. So the company was in bankruptcy, at which point Paul Singer bought its debt, took over that debt in bankruptcy, and in a sense, took control over the debt proceedings at that time. I'll tell you the rest of the story following Tucker. Singer and the other funds at the helm, the company took billions of dollars in government bailouts. Paid I'll get to the government bailout. For by you. Obama's auto czar compared those tactics to extortion, but they continued anyway. Obama's auto czar was the one who gave the bailout. Now, Delphi did not take, as far as I can tell, did not take a direct payment from the bailout of the auto industry. So here's the story. You've got Delphi bankrupt. You've got GM paying it a little bit of money, but GM running out of money, having no money. Paul Singer and a bunch of hedge funds buy its debt for pennies on the dollar, just like with those foreign countries. The government, in 2009 under Obama, sets up a, if you remember, uh, what was it called? It was like the, the Save the Auto Industry Committee of government officials. Uh, actually, uh, Obama appointed a former private equity fund manager to run this, this entity in charge of bailing out the auto industry. And they came in and they took over, basically took over uh, uh, General Motors and started managing General Motors. They created, let me just see, I've got, I've got part of this history written down here. Um, let's see. Yeah, so GM is, is on the verge of bankruptcy. Delphi is basically on the verge of liquidation. Uh, and, you know, Bush in 2008 had spent $17.4 billion to rescue GM and Chrysler with loans. And then Obama assembled this task force led by a Wall Street private equity guy by the name of Stephen Ratner uh, to oversee the bailout of the auto industry, to pour much more money in there, right? At some point in March of 2009, GM was supposed to give $150 million to Delphi based on just keeping it alive. And the reason GM wanted to keep Delphi alive is because the auto parts, without Delphi, GM was dead. It would have no auto parts. So GM was about to make a, 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 a payment of $150 million to Delphi, and the task force said no. So within a few Couple of months, again, this is on the verge of, of liquidation. A private equity firm by the name of Platinum Equity, a, a, a group that I actually know. I know the I know the founders, and I've I've been I, I've been a Platinum Equity, um, a very very successful private equity firm, actually bids to buy the assets. So they're going to buy the assets of Delphi, but. Nothing here can happen without the Treasury Department, without Obama's commission approving it. 
And in addition, Peter Singer and the other hedge funds say, wait a minute, Platinum is buying this company way too cheap. Way too cheap. So they come in and they make a higher offer. They bid more money for the company. And basically, right, they offer to exchange the debt, the loans that they have, for equity, for control over the company. And in July 2009, they cut a deal with GM that they will take over the company and will not be sold to Platinum. Now, GM provided financing at this point to this new company that's coming out of bankruptcy, right? Delphi comes out of bankruptcy, steered by these hedge funds, and GM provides them with financing. $1.7 billion of a direct investment in its equity. They get shares for the $1.7 billion. Now, where does GM get $1.7 billion? Because GM is on the verge of bankruptcy. GM gets the $1.7 billion from the $20 billion, I think, or however much it was, how much did they, you know, from the massive pool of money that the Treasury gave them. So the Treasury lends money to GM. GM makes an investment with that money in Delphi, an investment that they got back with massive returns a few years later when Delphi goes public. Now, Peter Singer in the story is a hero. He sales, saves Delphi. He actually pays the debt holders more than what they would have got a platinum of taking it over. Yes, he gets government subsidized money, but the problem is not the hedge funds and Peter Singer. The problem is that the government subsidized money was going to GM to bail them out. The government should have never bailed them out. Anyway, I, I don't know if now at this point I'm boring you with all the details, but I just want to give you I, I, just a glimpse into the complexity involved here. Now, it's true. The Delphi, in order to stay competitive, in order to actually become a competitive company, and Delphi exists today, Delphi is thriving, it just split into two companies of auto parts manufacturers. Delphi did a few things. One, it changed its official place of incorporation to the UK in order to take advantage of lower taxes. Second, second, it fired a lot of people. It moved assembly of some of the parts to China or to the UK or to other parts of the world. Indeed, Delphi today has factories, assemblies, offices in 24 countries around the world. It employs 150,000 people, of which it's hard to tell. That, uh, I, I couldn't quite find the numbers, but about 10,000 in America, maybe more. Its headquarters is in the U.S., in Michigan. It's still run, they still run the company from Michigan, even though they pay U.K. taxes. Now, Elliot, I mean, uh, Elliot, which is the fund, Paul Singer's fund, they made a fortune off of this. They made a lot of money because they bought it cheap and then they ran it well and they took it public and we have an auto parts manufacturer who's selling parts to GM who helped ultimately GM survive. Now, granted, GM should have been allowed to go bankrupt and Delphi probably would have gone bankrupt with it. But to pull out Paul Singer was subsidized by U.S. bailout is, again, dishonest, partial information, dropping all context, just an attempt to slur and condemn somebody for what? For what? To go after somebody who is funding people who are never Trumpers. By the way, I get no money from Paul Singer. The Iron Man Institute has never gotten any money from Paul Singer, although I tried, but I never managed to get a meeting with him. So I have no love for Paul Singer because he supports me or anything like that. 
I would tell you if he did, because I don't mind being supported by people like Paul Singer. It's just in this case, it's just not true. I happen to love what he does. I happen to love the kind of capitalist he is. I happen to love the process that is capitalism. Not the kind of wishy-washy, touchy-feely, nationalist socialism of Tucker. I'm talking about capitalism, the beauty of change, the beauty of people using their minds to figure out solutions, to reallocate capital to its most productive use, to save companies, to destroy companies when they need to be destroyed. Watch other people's money. Tucker Carlson should watch other people's money. He could learn a lot from that movie. Tell me the value of selfishness. Use another word, self-esteem. The value of selfishness is that you esteem yourself as a value, that you live according to your nature, which means by the judgment of your own mind and you respect your own mind, you respect your own ability to do the right thing. Therefore, you respect your, the possibility of being a morally virtuous person and you regard yourself as a value worth preserving. Let me bring it down from Kant a little bit to a bromide that I had drummed into me as a child, and maybe you've heard it. Happiness comes from making other people happy. Oh, yes. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't heard it? And that's the trouble. Let's aim at the day when people will not hear it anymore. Because it isn't true. It isn't justifiable. And the first question you would have to ask is, why? Why is it good to want others to be happy, but not yourself. And I suppose you will be told that, well, but they will work for your happiness and not their own. Well, it's like an exchange of Christmas presents that neither party wants, but that you have to exchange presents and you're not allowed morally to do something for yourself. Whereas what I say, you can make others happy when and if those others mean something to you selfishly. If you love them, then you want to make them happy. Fine. If you don't love them, that's not a moral crime. You don't have to love everybody. You cannot love everybody because it's a meaningless expression. You can love only those whom you value. And if they contribute to your happiness, you contribute to theirs. That's fine. But each one of you has to be selfish about it. Supposing somebody were in love with you and said, I, I love you because you're so bad so i sacrifice myself and i'm going to love you would you accept that or no, would you say it's the most no sir i wouldn't either that's the most insulting thing anyone could have said to you and yet that's what altruism would demand and there is a great russian writer who tried to practice it dostoevsky who did marry a poor uh, stupid little uh, seamstress who whom he didn't love at all out of the desire to make her happy, you see. The end of it was she committed suicide. Now that is an altruist practice. That's what altruism leads to. How about it's more blessed to give than to receive? Well, that's obviously the welfare state. That's a clearly motivated slogan. Uh, to please uh, give me something and you'll be blessed, but I will keep your, your material goods. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show. And, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...